So hello everybody and welcome to this Agenda for Change Systems Learning Exchange mm -hmm. event. My name is Tracy Keatman and I'm supporting Agenda for Change with the facilitation of the discussion today. So after our welcome, I'm going to introduce everybody that you can see in the videos in a moment. Um, we'll have an introduction to Agenda for Change. We'll introduce our speakers and recap on the key points that were raised in their videos. And then we'll have a panel discussion in effect. So asking some questions that were submitted in advance and having a discussion with you all as the audience through the Q&A channel as well. And then afterwards, Alec um, from Agenda for Change will share a little bit more about um, the next steps and the next themes. So that's the, the agenda for the day. So to the introductions, um, as I mentioned, I'm Tracy Keatman. I'm the facilitator of today's event. We've also got Susan online and she's the global coordinator for Agenda for Change. Um, so as our co-host, she'll talk about Agenda for Change in a few moments. And as I said, She's also doing the closed captioning. So thank you, amazing there, Susan. We've got Alec in the top corner. If you want to wave, Alec, there we go. Um, she's the content strategist for Agenda for Change. She'll be managing the Q&A and the chat boxes throughout the session and also leading the polls. Then moving around the videos, um, they might not be in the same order for you as for me. So on mine next, I have Ben Blumenthal and Agnes Montanguero from Helvitas. They'll be talking to us today. You can both wave as well. We could just see you there. Ha ha, there you are. Thank you. Thank you, Ben and Agnes. They'll be talking to us today about their experience in Burkina Faso and Niger. We also have Farel Ndango, who's in charge of partnerships for Water for Good in the Central African Republic, and he's, his colleague David Ame, who is the Director of International Partnerships from Water for Good. So uh, probably a bit of a delay, Farel, but if you could wave as well. <laughs> Hello, Farel. Hello, David. Nice to meet you. Nice to see you. And then we have Jan Maloney who is currently from SNV Nepal, but led the, the Democratic Republic of Congo WASH Consortium from 2016 to 29. And you'll be hearing from each and everybody soon. So thank you all and thanks for waving. And you can also probably see a picture of Susanna, a Spanish interpreter as well there. So that's the, the introductions done. And thank you all again for joining us. Um, so next, I'd like to um, hand over to Alec for her to conduct the first poll of the day, which is all about how familiar you might be with Agenda for Change. So over to you, Alec. Thanks, Tracy. All right, I have a quick poll here. So I will launch this for you guys to fill out before we get started. You should see a poll pop up on your screen right now. If any of you can't see it, you can feel free to send me a chat. I see some votes. I'll let it go for about 15 more seconds for those of you who are just seeing it. Thank you. All right. So as far as how familiar you all are with the purpose and activities of the Agenda for Change collaboration, it looks like the majority are very familiar or somewhat familiar. So for those of you that answered unfamiliar or this is your first time, uh, my colleague Susan is going to introduce us a little bit more and explain what we do. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me now? Alec? I'm assuming you guys can hear me. I, I can't close caption and talk at the same time, but welcome all of you to our first global results. Uh, sorry, <laughs> Peer Systems Learning Exchange. We're very excited that we have about um, 100 registrants. 
um, and we believe some of these people will pop in and out and we're very excited to have you from about 30 countries. The Agenda for Change is a collaboration of like-minded organizations that we call members um, and they have adopted a set of common principles and approaches. Can anyone hear me? You could note in the chat box. Okay, everyone but Alec can hear me. Okay, great. Um, our members work collectively to advocate for and support national and local governments in strengthening WASH systems. Uh, where, and our ultimate goal is to achieve SDG 6. So basically, these are all members who work on WASH system strengthening, and we want to try to do that better together. And you can see um, we have the Agenda for Change joint principles now available in English, Spanish, and French, and Portuguese on our website. Um, and let's see, next slide, Tracy. I don't know if Tracy can go to the next slide, but I'll keep going. Um, we have 40, uh, we've been trying to, oh, interesting. <laughs> Tracy can't hear me either. Uh, this is funny. We are testing this experiment here. Um, let me chat to her. But we have been um, trying to figure out the, uh, okay, so this next slide is a structure of what we call the global hub. So the agenda for change is the 14 members who do work in many, many countries. And we have um, a global hub, which is consists of committees and working groups. And this is the structure here. The steering committee maintains, um, they are the, there's one member from, one person from each member, so there's 14 members on the steering committee, and they are responsible for the strategy of Agenda for Change, for, for setting the joint principles, for coming up with the governance framework, um, for setting the work plan for the, um, for the collaboration. And I won't go into too much detail, but you can see we have three working groups and they are responsible for, for guiding in certain areas, so for advocacy, um, trying to help influence behavior uh, both within our membership and externally. The technical advisory working group thinking on thinking about things like how to measure system strengthening, thinking about tools for doing better wash system strengthening. And then the communications and knowledge management working group, um, which is responsible and has been for um, doing a lot of the work of getting together um, the website and for knowledge products and for learning events. Um, these are all um, in, in the process of evolution, and maybe next year they might look different. But um, this is the basic structure. So next slide, please. Oh, sorry, before I go on that, uh, the global secretariat is me and Alec, and we are both um, working, uh, I work in DC, and Alec is in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and we work together to try to make the things happen that the steering committee and working groups um, uh, decide are important. There are three key activities for this year. One is supporting stronger country collaborations among members, and there's about 10 countries where we're starting those conversations. Um, another is um, trying to gather all of the evidence um, from the various members that they've collected and synthesizing that to demonstrate that working like this does lead to stronger systems and better service levels. And the third is to um, get our uh, members to uh, get to know each other, and that's what you're doing right here. Okay, so next slide. If you haven't visited our website yet, it's, um, we've refreshed it in the past few months, so there's a lot more functionality to it. It's washagendaforchange.org. Um, this is um, our initial effort at trying to capture where our 14 members are working to strengthen WASH systems, and it's about 41 countries right now. Um, we keep getting new information, so we're updating that as we go. And I think there's one more, which is the building blocks. Um, the members have come together, and each, each member has its own framework for system strengthening. Um, but as a collaboration, we generally agree that these are the important building blocks of a strong wash system. This isn't a prescriptive way of thinking, it's just a way to think about what a strong wash system could look like. 
and there's a paper that describes these in more detail that is also available on our website under the library. Um, and now I will turn it back to, uh, is it Tracy? And start recaptioning. Thanks again for joining. Okay, thank you very much. I know uh, I personally had a few problems with the audio there, so many apologies, everybody. Um, and sorry if I move the slides a bit slowly. <laughs> thank you so much for the for the background to Agenda for Change. So next of all, um, what we'd like to do is to introduce our speakers a little bit more. And so. Um, you saw them, I introduced them very briefly, but I'm sure you also saw them or heard them on the videos that were shared on the Agenda for Change YouTube channel. Um, so we're not watching those videos here today, but we will hear a two minute recap of the key points from each. So we'll be timing each for their two minute short overview of their presentation. So first of all, um, maybe, um, Ben from Helvetus, please could you tell us a little bit about your video called System Strengthening and Emergency Responses from your experience in Burkina Faso and Niger? Okay, hi Ellen, thank you very much for having me actually. It's a great pleasure to be here and to share with you uh, our experiences. What we tried is to summarize, let's say, our experience from working in uh, Niger and Burkina Faso since more than 15 years. Um, Helvetas is a traditional development organization that ventured into ever more into also emergency response, simply because we needed to, because the situation uh, asked for it. And we actually tried to take over our approaches that we use in development work also to apply them on emergency uh, situations. So what we tried to summarize is to, to, to club these, these experiences into four principles, which we shared in our presentation. The first of the principles is to have government leadership also in emergency situations to work with the government. The second is to work with local actors and networks to include local, um, local actors that are already there in the areas where you work then to work as much as possible, the third principle with local markets, to use local supply chains, so not bringing in outside things, but really hope to work with the system that exists already. And the fourth point is to continue using dialogue, working on a constructive dialogue with all different parties, stakeholders, especially also with the government in emergency situations that are very often very overwhelmed, but it is important that you continue working with them together. Of course, then I, at the, at the very end of the presentation, I also included some critical questions, which I actually would love to hear also from, from the participants, so not only me answering. I don't have all the, the answers to every question, um, but we also have questions actually on how to dialogue with the government, because it's not only government, it's all the actors in emergency situations. The government is very often not too interested in doing uh, coordination with other actors. On the other hand, you have the whole UN system, which seems to do nothing else than coordinate among themselves, most of basically. So, uh, um, and you try to navigate there and actually do some good work. So it's not always easy to do that. The second question is, as usual, how to make sure that we do not have unintended negative impacts. With our work, we try to do our very best. Obviously, everybody is doing do no harm, but sometimes we have to go beyond that. Um, it's not only enough to do the basic minimum of do no harm. You really need to be very careful not to have unintended negative consequences of your work. And the big question, as usual, when we talk about systems and, and strengthening systems, this is really something which is in the typical double, if not triple nexus. Um, we try to strengthen that as an organization, but unfortunately we see that especially donors are not always very interested to do that. Um, one of the other speakers I remember in his presentation also mentioned exactly the same. Donors are either clear-cut humanitarian donors or development donors 
they do not want to have something to do with the other side. So how can we overcome that divide between these two? Okay, my two minutes, I'm very happy to share with you more and especially to discuss with you. Thank you. Sorry. Yes, I was muted, everyone. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, somebody had to do it and it's best that it was me. So, <laughs> sorry, I'll just start that all over again. <laughs> next, so thank you, Ben. Uh, next, I would like to invite Farel from Water for Good to tell us in two minutes a quick recap of his video on WASH systems amid conflict, fragility and humanitarian action in the Central African Republic. So over to you, Farrell. Thank you. Bonjour, tout le monde. Je suis très content de rejoindre de cette cette équipe et d'échanger, de vous partager aussi notre expérience en tant que l'organisation Water for Good en RPA. Nous sommes une organisation Water for Good depuis installée en Centre Afrique depuis 15 ans et que Nous, 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 nous parlons de, de cet accès à l'eau euh, de manière durable. Alors donc, depuis 15 années, on est installé dans ce pays que dans ma présentation, je vous fais mention que c'est un pays extrêmement fragile et que euh, nous essayons, nous approchons la communauté à les apprendre comment il faut euh, garder les ouvrages, avoir l'accès d'une manière durable euh, à l'eau potable et que euh, nous ne sommes pas la seule organisation qui fait le roche. Il y a d'autres aussi qui le font, mais d'une autre manière. Et il y a des organisations aussi installées dans ce pays euh, qui totalisent les, la même durée que nous, qui font euh, l'urgence. Et que euh, nous tissons aussi dans un premier lieu de, de bonnes relations avec euh, le gouvernement centrafricain et d'essayer de leur faire à fond, comprendre notre but, notre rôle dans ce pays et que euh, nous confrontons aussi, quand vous suivez ma présentation, nous confrontons aussi à des défis, euh, à des défis qu'il faut relever, euh, chercher à, à communiquer, une bonne, à faire une bonne communication avec euh, le gouvernement, avec le, le département du secteur, avec les autres ONG, les ONG qui travaillent dans le même secteur, essayer de maintenir une bonne communication entre nous et aussi essayer de faire comprendre à la communauté Euh, de cerner la, la différence entre euh, ce qu'on nous on fait d'une manière durable et ce que euh, les autres font comme l'urgence et de, de faire une bonne coordination entre les ONG qui viennent interviennent d'une manière urgente et que nous essayons aussi de prendre le relève de pérenniser de, de garder euh, l'accès à l'eau d'une manière durable donc euh, à la fin de ma présentation j'aimerais à ce que euh, Tout ce monde, tous les amis qui sont dans cette conférence euh, nous aident à, à bien communiquer et à, à prendre le relève après les interventions d'urgence. C'est un plaisir d'être ensemble avec vous et d'échanger et de voir comment est-ce qu'on doit avancer d'une manière, euh, dans l'ensemble, avancer dans un même but. Quoi. Je vous remercie et que euh, on continuera à échanger et de voir comment est-ce qu'on peut avancer. Merci. Thank you so much, Farrell. And so, last but not least, I would like to invite Jan Maloney to tell us a little bit more about the video that he made for us, um, which was called Strengthening Wash Systems for Long-Term Service Provision in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So, Jan, over to you for a two-minute recap on your, on your key points. Uh, sure. Uh, thank you, Tracy, and uh, hi, everyone. I hope everyone can uh, can hear me. Um, so uh, the DRC Wash Consortium was a project by Concern Worldwide and other four international NGOs, and it was funded by uh, DFID uh, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo from 2013 to 2019, so about uh, six years uh, duration. Um, the focus was on uh, rural wash 
and the overarching goal was to uh, strengthen sustainable wash services in uh, rural communities. This was the high level goal, which of course uh, uh, took many different uh, shapes depending on uh, the various components on the project. One of the key tools that the consortium uh, designed and followed was what we branded the economic approach. The economic approach was a, uh, an adaptation to the context of rural DRC of the life cycle cost approach for uh, water supply systems. Uh, this is something that was quite specific to the DRC wash consortium in that, uh, in that country. Um, something that we have uh, found throughout the project and also at the end uh, when we did our uh, lessons learning exercises is the influence of the fragile context of uh, rural DRC on our ways of working. Uh, that was why, that was because uh, there was a generally very poor kind of baseline in terms of not only wash but also uh, social and economical uh, factors. Plus, in addition, you would have rapid onset crisis that would strike at a certain point in times. Crisis related to uh, public health, uh, such as cholera or sometimes even Ebola, and crisis related to a local conflict with all um, displacements of population that, that follow. Um, what uh, we have also found out, however, uh, is that even in this kind of circumstances, in this kind of context, there is room for development actors to achieve longer term um, uh, system, uh, longer term, longer term uh, uh, sustainable wash systems on condition that there is a, a consistent and a, a coherent effort towards uh, strengthening systems, strengthening sustainable uh, water supply in uh, the, the areas of operation. So this is something that is a little bit the core of our message. The context can be very complicated and challenging. However, there are the means to uh, um, deal successfully with that kind of challenges. Uh, also something that I would like to mention just uh, to conclude this very uh, short summary is that I am presenting this, but of course there's a number of other colleagues uh, who have been behind the DRC Wash Consortium back in the day and who are still now in Concern DRC, in, and this, uh, in Concern Worldwide, sorry. And I would like to mention in particular um, two members of the Consortium Coordination Unit uh, who were uh, with us in the last couple of years who are uh, Maria Livia de Rubeis and Christina Nielsen, who contributed a lot to the results of the projects, but also contributed a lot to knowledge management and to lessons learned. And I think it's important to uh, acknowledge that in this occasion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jan, for that quick overview. And so next, um, what we'd like to do is to ask us, ask all our panel members a few questions to dig a little bit deeper into the, the experiences that they shared on their videos and also to address some of the questions sent by you all in advance of this webinar today. So first of all, I have a, a question for you, um, which really is about um, how do you actually bring together the system strengthening efforts with long-term engagement? So this question um, is from Fraser Goff from WaterAid Australia. And specifically, he mentions that Pharrell had a great, a great quote in his video, which was that the humanitarian sector has no memory of what is done in a country. And so it's obvious that the system strengthening efforts um, of all of you was made possible by your long-term engagement and those relationships that you already had in country. So in light of this, what do you as our speakers, our panelists today, recommend that humanitarian and emergency response agencies who might not have those long histories do differently? What is it that they should do differently in their humanitarian response in order to maintain and strengthen WASH systems. So first on this question, I'd like to give the floor to Farrell, if 
uh, Farel can still hear us. He may have just turned his video off, but um, Farel, we would like to come to you first on this question, please. Je vous remercie pour cette question. Euh, quand je dis les, les agents humanitaires n'ont aucun, aucun, aucun souvenir euh, du système WASH dans la communauté, je voulais par là euh, parler d'une bonne collaboration qui devait être euh, entre nous et les, les, les agents humanitaires qui viennent faire l'urgence hein, dans la communauté. Et je voulais parler, je voulais dire par là que euh, s'il y avait une bonne communication, ils doivent nous demander je donne un exemple sur un point d'eau donné et qu'est-ce qui a été fait la pompe a été installée en quelle date quelle est la durée de, de cette réalisation qu'est-ce que vous avez fait au préalable et continuer prendre la suite si par exemple une pompe a, devrait être réhabilitée que cette pompe soit réhabilitée et que cette pompe là revient dans notre système de maintenance et comme ça euh, la communauté saura que Cette, cette intervention est venue d'urgence. Il y a eu un financement d'urgence et que ils ont procédé à cette urgence et après Water for Good viendra pour la suite pour pérenniser, pour garder, maintenir ces points d'eau là. Alors cette communication n'a pas lieu, n'a pas eu lieu durant ce moment qu'on a travaillé, qu'on qu travaille en RCA. Donc nous on souhaite à ce que cette communication soit efficace pour que Les, les efforts puissent euh, conjuguer d'un même moment que euh, d'un même moment que voilà et les interventions d'urgence sont passées et que euh, l'ONG Water for Good continue la pérennisation de ces points d'eau là pour le bien-être de la communication c'est pour ça que je dis euh, l'agence communautaire les gens ne sont n'ont pas de, de souvenir de ce qui se fait euh, sur le terrain Great. Thank you so much, Pharrell. So a real strong focus there on the communication, collaboration, coordination point. And so next, I'd like to ask that same question to Ben. What can you add from your perspective? Well, Pharrell already told everything, basically. It really is important to talk to each other. Um, it's true. I also we have seen that uh, very often, uh, not only here in Burkina Faso, I from my previous lives and in other organizations, have seen basically the same uh, approach of a lot of humanitarian organizations. They just come say, "Now we are here. Now step aside. We take over." This doesn't work. Honestly, this just doesn't work. They really need to work together with long-term development partners in the country with uh, the, the government, with UN uh, organizations that are there. Um, the coordination with, with UN very often works very well. Um, the coordination with OCHA, with ECHO, with the European, and, uh, European and AID, that works with humanitarian organizations, because these are their donors. So it's probably also from our side that we, as development organizations, should try to reach out to these international agencies to say, look, rely on us. We are here. We know the context. We know the partners. We know what needs to be done. Work together with us. So we should also try to reach out to them, to work with them together um, and try to bridge this gap between development and humanitarian um, emergency help. But maybe Agnes has some, some more to say on, from our side. She has more experience with help with us approaches. Yeah, maybe I think it's a, it's a very complex question and I just would like to add a few more um, points for the, the reflection. So I think one, one element is, is um, we, we often see these um, humanitarian experts uh, parachuted in a country after a disaster, staying a few months and then uh, flying away and being parachuted in another country. And um, there is this principle of localization discussed among uh, humanitarian actor, which I think is very important. And it's, it's about anchoring humanitarian response within local um, actors, within local institutions. And we see a lot of efforts in this sense towards this localization. Of course, it's, it's a challenge and there's still a long way to go, but we see already progress, for example, um, 
um, WASH cluster meetings co-chaired by um, a representative of the of the government, uh, for example, the health department, and a, a humanitarian actor, for example, UNICEF. Or so I think we we already see uh, a progress in this sense. Um, I, I'd like to give an example of, of of our work of what we what we try to do and. Um, I bring an example of, um, unfortunately, not from from West Africa, or uh, but but from Haiti. And in Haiti, uh, there is a, a local board, body in charge of emergency response. That's the it's called um, Protection Civile or, or Civil Protection uh, under the municipality. And what we do is when we work, when we partner with municipalities and support them in developing their wash plan, we try to involve those. Um, uh, civil protection units uh, in the planning. So it means the, the, the district wash plan or municipal wash plans include or integrates elements of emergency response, elements of preparedness. So I think that's that's one way, um, that's one element where we, where we can link our um, efforts in system strengthening and, and emergency response. That's great. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Agnes. And then coming to Jan, from your experience, would you like to add something to this question? Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, thanks for that. Um, I would like to take it from a slightly different angle, if possible. Um, maybe also because of my background as someone who has worked a lot in humanitarian aid, as well as in longer term development. Um, what I see is that a lot of humanitarian agencies, they do have long histories in countries. One of the big differences though, is that they work on much shorter project cycles. So you, they wouldn't have like five or seven or 10 years projects, but rather 12 months projects. This is a big difference. Also something that I think we should recognize is that humanitarian aid has changed a lot in the last 20 or 30 years. So, you know, the image of uh, ready-made kits being parachuted uh, from an airplane, um, is it something that uh, is, 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 is more, it's is, is, is quite rare nowadays. And a lot of humanitarian organizations, they tend to put an emphasis on uh, local markets and uh, try to understand uh, local dynamics. I think we need to recognize this uh, to, be, uh, to be fair. Um, this kind of what I think, what I believe is that this kind of transition of humanitarian aid towards a more uh, maybe a more uh, localized also way of, of working, uh, this transition could be much faster, I believe, if uh, donors kind of mix a bit more humanitarian funding and uh, longer term development funding. Uh, because as it was already mentioned, uh, as it is now, um, this kind of fundings tend to be quite rigidly separated. And this dichotomy doesn't really exist in nature. Uh, crises are uh, partly uh, acute crisis, partly longer term crisis. Uh, but if uh, what is available on the market, so to say, is uh, short term funding for uh, six months or 12 months uh, emergency relief, then in a way that's what organizations are pushed to, um, to get, which in turn generates a little bit of say dependence on that kind of modality and uh, blocks or, or slows down a little bit a transition towards a more mature, um, I would say, uh, mixture and, and uh, blending of uh, humanitarian aid and longer term development work. Uh, it is possible, but I'm trying to say that it is not just the humanitarian actors. It is, I think, a more general picture that we should uh, look at. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. And I think there's some key points emerging there around the coordination as well as the transition and communication, but also planning for these kinds of changes, as Agnes mentioned. So moving on to a next question that came in from um, the audience before the session today. Um, Ben highlighted in his video and mentioned it earlier as well that there can be some negative outcomes of emergency response work, such as the increased brick prices, as you'll recall from, from the video um, for the women working in IDP camps. 
So I'd like to, to come to each of you again and say, well, what can we do as a sector to monitor and document those negative outcomes in order for us to learn and hopefully therefore minimize them? Um, and perhaps if it's helpful to explain if you've actually come across some particular negative outcomes of this type of engagement as well. So to give us an insight into, into which type of outcomes you might have experienced, but at least um, for sure to figure out how we actually learn from them. And so Ben, I'll come to you first on this one, if that's okay. Unmute this time. So thank you very much. Actually, I just brought this example as a possible example. We actually tried to avoid that the brick prices went up. So uh, I just took that as an example to, to highlight that there are possibilities. What we do actually in our programs, and this is not only here in Burkina Faso, this is throughout our organization, we try to apply systematically not just do no harm principles, but what we call conflict sensitive project management. So not only looking at the context, trying to understand the context we work in, looking at dividers and, and, uh, and connectors, but also going beyond that and looking at every single action that we take, what kind of consequences can that have? And we discuss that with our partners, with, our, with the actors on the ground. So this helps us to minimize as much as possible also unintended negative consequences. Um, but you are, of course, absolutely right that very often negative um, examples, uh, failures and so on, are very badly documented. We are not proud of them, obviously, as, as usual. We document our successes, we communicate them, uh, we try to, to model them into approaches and an app. Very nice. We do not do the same with failures which is a shame, it's a pity, because very often you learn much more from your failures and you can help many other people with your failures if you openly discuss them. So these kind of exchanges that we have, are having now here are perfect to also talk about this among peers with, with others to actually learn from each other. Um, unfortunately, I've never participated, but somebody told me once that they made, I can't remember in what context, a so-called failure fail, to really talk about and explaining failures they had and the lessons that they learned from that. I think it's a fantastic idea to do so. To, uh, to, to do that, to um, exchange openly, it can also be fun actually to do that, I think. Um, so yes, systematically um, documenting also failures and unintended consequences I think it's important that we do not do it uh, enough, in my opinion. Great, no, thank you. And just to add to the audience here, that if you do want, have a question, the Q&A seems to be working for some people, but not others. So if you do also have a question, you can type it in the chat box if the Q&A doesn't work for you, okay? Great, thank you for that, Ben. So I think you're right. This um, having a more of a focus on learning from failures as well as success and documenting those failures is uh, is really key. And you know that learning and adaptation component is is should be at the forefront. Um, so next, I'll come to Jan perhaps to give us some comments on this this question as well. Um, Jan, if you could take the mic. Thank you. Um, I, I agree with what uh, Ben said, um, of course. Um, what I would also emphasize is that I think uh, the wash sector and the development sector should become better at documenting outcomes in general, good, average, or bad. Uh, there is a lot of, you know, sometimes what's called a gray literature that's not really disseminated or shared. And I think we should all uh, get much better than this at uh, using uh, forums and uh, publications and platforms in order to share more and more outcomes. And I would think that if we get more, uh, say, comfortable and familiar with having our outcomes being discussed and debated, then we would also become slightly more, uh, say, comfortable if some negative outcomes are discussed and debated. I think it's a general trend uh, in the, in that, that, should, that should be a bit stronger. I also would like to, uh, um, also maybe to, to, uh, to, uh, to say that this is not specific to WASH or to the development sector. 
I believe in all industries, there is a tendency to showcase uh, successes and to uh, discuss uh, negative results in uh, uh, closed rooms. And I think this is a natural, a natural tendency. Um, and something that maybe is also uh, worth uh, thinking about is that sometimes as organizations, we hesitate to share negative outcomes also because of fear of a reputational damage. There is, there are um, competition dynamics uh, in the development sector uh, in terms of access to funding typically. Uh, because most uh, organizations require funding to functions, they are not self-sustained. In that terms, the, there is probably some degree of fear that if we uh, talk about uh, some experiments or pilots or practices that did not work well, there is a degree of fear that this could backfire and uh, could generate reputational damage, which would in turn generate uh, potential loss of funding. Uh, it's not the only aspect, but I think that this, uh, this probably plays uh, a role in um, sometimes in the reluctance that we have to share uh, outcomes, especially when we are not particularly proud of those outcomes. Yes, no, that's true. And also one question that came in while you were speaking was, um, well, what, which kind of failures have you yourself experienced and that we could learn from, for example? if you can think of one. And I will also ask this to Farrell so he can be thinking when I come next to him. <laughs> so we'll put you on the spot, Jan, and uh, see yeah. <laughs> what are these yeah. kinds of things? So that, many, uh, so many. So many. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's uh, uncountable. Um, a failure or partial failure that I would like to mention now, um, because it's about the DRC Watch Consortium, uh, which I kind of represent in this, in this um, occasion, is that uh, we had a side component of uh, strengthening um, local uh, supply chains of uh, hand pump spare parts. Um, and that was challenging and uh, we did not, probably we did not put enough emphasis on that. Uh, so something that I believe, uh, something that I learned is that in future, that should be a central part of uh, the project design in that, kind of, in that kind of context. So it's maybe not a failure, but it's a kind of uh, weight that should be slightly shifted in a, in a different way. And uh, yeah, I hope that my uh, colleagues in Concern Worldwide won't be angry at me for saying that. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Jan, for, for sharing. And so coming next to Farel, um, how about um, from your perspective, uh, what, what advice would you give? And also what are the kinds of failures or semi-failures that you've experienced uh, in your work? Alors, merci encore. Euh, le conseil que je pourrais donner euh, sur ces résultats et ensuite euh, notre échec partiel, le conseil, c'est que je reviens toujours sur euh, la bonne communication, la bonne communication entre les partenaires, entre les, les partenaires dans le secteur, de bien communiquer, que ce soit euh, les réalisations déjà exécutées, qui, qui soient documentées comme l'a dit Ben au début, que cette documentation soit accessible pour que les gens qui viendront par après puissent acquérir de cette connaissance pour voir que voilà, euh, sur ce terrain, il y a eu ça qui a été réussi, il y a eu ça qui a été euh, manqué. Et voilà, les gens qui viendront après pourront euh, faire une bonne réalisation. Seulement, euh, vu que les gens viennent, il y a des interventions d'urgence et qu'il n'y a pas de documentation, il n'y a pas d'histoire historique de ce, de ce qui a été fait, alors les gens qui viennent par après sont toujours dans, le même, dans la même situation. Donc il va falloir mettre l'accent sur la documentation, des réalisations, que ce soit d'urgence, que ce soit quelque chose qui est fait pour une longue durée, que ce soit documenté pour l'avenir. Et alors pour l'échec partiel que nous on a vécu, qu'on a expérimenté, c'est que je donnerai un exemple de chez nous. Euh, fut un moment, on en pensait avec des partenaires de l'Agence euh, nationale de l'eau et d'assainissement de chez nous, former des réparateurs, des, des réparateurs locaux, 
qui sont des réparateurs artisanaux, pour qu'ils puissent prendre en charge la, la, la maintenance et la réparation des points d'eau. Alors, on a vu que, arrivé à un certain moment, ces agents formés ne sont, pas, ne sont pas stables. Il y en a qui quittent leur localité pour une autre préfecture. Ils quittent la localité pour une autre localité et que ça pose problème si, en cas de panne ou en cas de maintenance, euh, les gens de la communauté ne peuvent pas avoir quelqu'un qui pourrait réparer. C'est pour cette raison que nous, à notre niveau, on a mis en place des équipes mobiles, des équipes de techniciens mobiles qui sillonnent à, à un moment donné tous les points d'eau répertorés dans notre système pour essayer de maintenir et de, de soutenir la communauté en réparant ces, ces points d'eau-là. Donc voilà euh, un exemple parmi euh, beaucoup d'exemples chez nous que je, que je partage avec vous. Great, no, thank you. And such a good point too about working and ensuring this continuity, um, continuity of people, of training, of partnerships, of services. So thank you. Thank you for everybody's honesty as well and reflections on that. Um, because we're running a little bit short of time and we've got many questions to get through, I'm going to ask a few rapid, rapid questions to, to, to each of you. So um, coming to Ben and then I'll have a question for Agnes. Um, Ben's question, let me just find it here. Okay, Ben. Um, one of the things um, that, uh, so this is a question from Francois Cangella from Catholic Relief Services in DRC. And he would like to hear a little bit more about what are the tricks used to innovate the financing of operations and maintenance of water infrastructure in this period of global economic paralysis? So it's quite a big picture question coming to you there, Ben. Um, what, what are your thoughts and uh, your rapid thoughts on this, might I, might I add? If only I had the answer to that question. It's, uh, it is a very important question, actually, um, which keeps us busy as, as, as well. So uh, what we try, at least, is in, in a very small way that those interventions that we do also in, in emergency, um, to coordinate them with the government, again, it's coordination to make sure that our interventions, for example, for upgrading water pumps and uh, building institutional latrines, that they have already been prioritized by the government in one way or the other. That means very often they are included in the so-called local development plans of the local governments. So we try to align our actions with what the government had in plan already to do anyway but that doesn't guarantee yet the long-term sustainability and the long-term um, durability, I have to say that in English, I can't speak English. Uh, yes, uh, sustainability of, the, uh, of the, the, the work that we do. So it's not only working with the government together, it's also working then with the local actors like water user associations to get them on board and to make sure that they can take over their role that was officially assigned to them, but very often they are not doing that. Of course, in emergency situations, this is very difficult to do because you have to accelerate everything. In a development um, project of more than one year, two years, five years, you have a lot of time to actually work with them, strengthen their capacities, um, to make sure that each of the actors know their roles and responsibilities. In an emergency situation, you need to do that in a fast forward way. So it's very often quick and dirty, hoping for the best that they actually take up the, uh, the roles that they were assigned and it keeps going even after you, uh, you leave the project. But yes, we are challenged with that as well. So uh, maybe Agnes has a better answer than I do. So. <laughs> right, well, Agnes, maybe you could add to that. And we have an additional question for you that's come in through the Q&A, um, which has been voted for five times. So I feel we should ask you this question too. So if you have additional reflections to what Ben said, please add that. But also we have an additional question for you, which was, you mentioned that you try to involve the government agency in the district wash plans, but are the district wash plans owned by local government or are they owned by Helvetas? So it would be interesting to hear your thoughts on that as well. So please go ahead. Okay. Um, so on, on the question, I'm not sure if I understand all the um, elements which are behind, but if, if we look at the current situation, we, we see that um, um, 
yes, some some there are the crisis, the, the COVID crisis has consequences on um, on food prices. So th there are regions where where people are just um, not able to pay for water anymore. And, and we've seen in different countries, like for example in Niger, that the government declared that the water service would be for free for uh, a, a couple of months. And this raises a, a number of questions and, and, and also this question on what are um, financing mechanisms in, in, this, in this context. And there also we, we don't really have the solution. What we've seen um, in Niger is that some of the municipalities have been advancing funds for the water operators. Um, when discussing this issue internally, um, some of our colleagues proposed to invest in um, pushing or promoting income generating activities to make sure that the, the population would have enough funds to be able also to, 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 pay to continue to pay for water even in this, in this period of crisis. So that's just what I wanted to add on the first question. And on, on the other question, on the question of ownership of, of plants, it's for us, it's a, it's a principle in all our countries. Ben can maybe specify for, for Burkina, but when we partner with municipalities, we support them in what they do. So we are, as Helvetas, we are not interested to have a plan, to have a wash plan. Um, what we do is we try to support the, the, municipal, the partner municipality or district in their efforts in um, developing this plan and implementing this plan. So it's, it's, it's their plan and, and it's something that we really try to clarify at the beginning of the project. And we, we set up a kind of agreement with our partners and, and, and it's, we really try to clarify our role as, as being in the, in the background and, and supporting where we can, supporting with some methodological inputs, supporting with some funds. Um, but we, are, we, we do not take any um, ownership in the products of the municipality. That's great. No, thank you so much. And thank you for the, the rapid responses as well there. Unfortunately, we're soon going to run out of time, um, which I think could also be a lesson learned for us all that we might need to dedicate more time to the sessions next because there are many additional questions that remain unanswered in the Q&A, but also some really valuable comments. Um, in both the Q&A and the chat box. So I want to thank the audience for adding those. And what we'll do is keep those questions and address them to our speakers. So to Pharrell and David, to Jan, and then to Ben and Anya. So we will be able to collect their answers to specific questions, but also to the additional ones that you've all kindly asked and that we've not had time to discuss directly today. Um, but next, I'd like to hand over to Alec who's going to also tell us a little bit more about the next steps and the next activities that will be part of this exchange, this learning exchange. Thanks, Tracy. Uh, do you have my slides that you can put up? Perfect, thank you. Hopefully, have they arrived? Yeah, great. Yeah, great. Um, I just wanted to give you all a chance for those of you that are joining us for the first time for an event like this, um, there are ways that you can share resources both for this event. So if you have reports or case studies related to this theme of fragile states or emergency response with a system strengthening lens, please do feel free to share those with me and I will put them on our web page. We also have ongoing um, opportunities for you to highlight an event or a system strengthening approach on our Twitter accounts, you can do a takeover. And I would love to interview you if um, you or your team would like to tell us about a project um, or response related to fragile states or system strengthening. And then if Tracy can go to the next slide. Related to this event, there are two more upcoming themes. Um, the, the second one is going to be on July 29th and that is strengthening wash systems, the new normal. So we have a series of speakers who will discuss how they are continuing to strengthen systems midterm um, with COVID response. And then theme three, I think we've actually decided to move this to September because I know August is, um, is gonna be busy. So this is going to be recasting our systems boundaries post COVID-19. Um, speakers will discuss how the pandemic is going to recast their thinking and practices going forward. 
So if you want to stay up to date on the upcoming themes, I've put the web address here. It's washagendaforchange.org slash learn. And you'll see um, I have a little toggle here. There are tabs on the website. So if you want to learn more about theme two or three, you can just click those tabs. Um, and please subscribe. There's a button on the website as well to stay updated. And that is how I alert you all um, with announcements of upcoming events, with our newsletters, and with knowledge products. I think there's one final poll that I wanted to do with you all, which is to ask you about upcoming knowledge products. So I will launch this now and I will share it with you. You should all be seeing a poll on your screen. These are some ideas for upcoming products. We wanted to get an idea of what your priorities were. All right, great. Looks like we have about 60% of you voting, so I will share this with you. Hopefully everyone can see this. It looks like linking systems approaches and rights-based approaches and also compiling experiences and approaches for engaging and collaborating with government at different levels. So thank you for that. We will definitely take it into account. Um, that's it for me, Tracy, if you want to uh, Take it back. Great, thank you, Alec. And thanks for putting together those polls. I think they give us a really rapid and interesting insight into what people are currently thinking. And so we have run out of time. I do apologize, we could continue. As I mentioned, we will collate those questions and get some answers back to you on, to all the participants, to you on those questions, and also be putting together a briefing note from the videos and from the session discussion today. So the, what remains from my side is to thank our speakers again, and also for their incredible inputs into creating those videos over the past few weeks. Um, so thank you all to David, Farrell, Jan, Ben, Agnes for all your support with that. And also to thank Susanna and Natalie for interpreting our event today. And I'd like to finally um, thank Alec, of course, for coordinating everything and moving us along and getting us together. And finally, Susan, would you like to add anything as well before we close up? No, just thanks to everybody for participating and we hope to um, see you the next theme. Great. Thank you all and hope to see you again next time.